This time on MotorWeek 92, we drive the new Oldsmobile 88. We also preview the exciting Dodge Viper. A MotorWeek producer makes her racing debut, plus plenty of automotive information from Pat Goss. So come drive with us next. Week 92, Television's Automotive Magazine, is made possible by funding from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the financial support of viewers like you. Your host for Motor Week 92, John Davis. Well, hello and welcome again to Motor Week 92. We're glad to have you with us. In the early 1980s, Oldsmobile was the rising star at General Motors. But along the way, Olds became confused as to its mission, and the star faded. For the past three years, Olds has attempted to find itself and rebuild its unique identity by branching out with uncharacteristic offerings such as the Silhouette Van and Bravada Sport Utility. Then last year, Olds began to revamp their passenger cars with a redesigned 98. Continuing their rebuilding from top to bottom for 92, Olds management has turned to their bread and butter sedan, the 88. It's all new. But is it going to be enough to put the twinkle back into the Oldsmobile star? With its fresh new styling, the Oldsmobile 88 Royale distinguishes itself from its GM H-body counterparts, the Buick LeSabre and Pontiac Bonneville. While its 110.8-inch wheelbase and four-wheel independent suspension have been carried over from last year, body panels have been stretched and smoothed for a more flowing line two-door models will no longer be available. Twin ultra-slim grills are mounted between flush headlights, and the smooth roof line and rear deck, while still in the Olds family, have a hint of Infiniti Q45. This big front-wheel drive car boasts 4.1 more inches of body, while still being able to slice through the wind with less aerodynamic drag than before. The Olds gets its power from the latest version of GM's tried and true 3800 series engine. Improvements to the 3.8-liter V6 raise horsepower to 170 and torque to 220 pound-feet. A column-mounted shifter controls the smooth four-speed overdrive automatic transmission, which is linked to the engine through a single electronic control. This combo provides the 88 with EPA mileage ratings of 18 city and 28 highway. We got a combined average of 24 miles per gallon. The quick shifting transmission also enables the power plant to launch the 3,500 pound sedan to 60 miles per hour in 9.5 seconds and end the quarter mile in 16.9 seconds at 82 miles per hour. Thanks to the optional FE3 suspension system, the 88 defies traditional American big car floatiness. There's a modicum of front end push into corners and the tail always follows the correct line. Body roll is moderate. The 88 handles very nicely for a full-size sedan. Even at higher speeds, the tail slides only a bit and the body doesn't over-tip. There was never a time when our test drivers felt out of control. Combined with good feedback from the power steering system, the suspension offers taut handling without sacrificing the comfort associated with a big family car. Standard on the LS are anti-lock brakes with disc in front and drums at the rear. Stopping distances from 60 miles per hour averaged a short 120 feet. A substantial amount of pedal pulse is felt when the ABS is activated. After repeated hard stops, there was little fade and no pull. With all its fine exterior and mechanical attributes, we had high hopes for the 88's interior as well. The instrument panel, a carryover design from the Posh 98, is at first glance an efficient driver-oriented design. Even the plastic wood is better than most. A driver's side airbag, an option for the last three years, is now standard on all 88s. The instrument cluster, however, is barely sufficient, but the sparse analog gauges are easy to read. The optional digital package is not recommended. Wide doors make front entry easy, and the split bench seat can accommodate three in a pinch. Seat adjustments are both manual and power, with the switches inconveniently located on the front of the seat. 
All 88s have a standard tilt wheel. Bottom seat cushions are very flat, but lower back support is good. Our biggest problems with this dash layout is the confusing array of buttons that operate the climate controls and stereo. There are too many. They look alike and they require a stretch to use. However, other interior amenities like this overhead console and armrest cup holders are excellent designs. The glove box is also quite large and hides a lockout switch for the optional remote trunk release. The broad rear seat is also quite flat, but there is lots of head and leg room. The LS includes rear ducts for heat and air conditioning, a nice touch. The trunk features a liftover that's not quite as low as we'd like, while the flat cargo space is slightly larger than before. Overall, the new design of the 1992 Olds 88 Royale hit us just right. We really like the styling, comfortable interior, good ride and handling combination, and the smooth powertrain. Misses include the confused ventilation and stereo controls, just too many buttons, the sparse gauge package, and the poor placement of the power seat controls. The 88 Royale's base price is $18,495, with the LS starting at $21,395. Our loaded test car came to $23,695. Not bad for a family sedan with such fine handling and most of the appointments of the flagship 98. Apparently, buyers agree, since early sales of the 88 have taken off. Oldsmobile's stated aim is to offer family sedan customers the most complete and advanced design at a reasonable price. We think the 88 Royale is close on target and will go a long way towards restoring Oldsmobile's broad popularity. In the 60s and early 70s, American car makers built some of the hottest, coolest cars ever created. In Decade of Muscle, author Henry Rasmussen looks at 12 of the most powerful cars to ever roll out of Detroit. The short capsule histories of each car make this more a coffee table book than a serious collector's guide. But the lavish color photographs are superb, and reason enough for any muscle car fan to add this book to his or her personal library. Whether you own a vintage muscle car or more typical transportation, Pat Goss has some advice that could help you out of a sticky situation. Pat? Have you ever had one of those days, John, when nothing seems to go right? Maybe it's a flat tire on the way to an important meeting. Or maybe in the middle of your vacation, in the middle of nowhere, the car dies. Well, we can't prevent things like that from happening, but we can help you prepare for the worst. Now. When anything like this happens, you have to be conscious of safety. And that means that you have to get the car off of the road as far as possible. Now, one of the things that you might want to consider in doing that is that you might want to have in the car a safety reflective vest to wear, especially at night, so that oncoming cars can see you. Secondly, you want them to be able to be aware of the fact that the car is disabled. Here is a typical type of flare, but keep in mind that these flares, these are the type that you light. You light these, they only last for either 15 or 30 minutes. So if you're going to be away from the car, these might not be the best thing. They could burn out and leave the car vulnerable. Here's the best thing right here. This is a trucker's triangle. They generally come in sets of two or three. You set these out, they reflect the light, to the oncoming cars and let the cars know that there's a disabled vehicle along the side of the road. These, of course, they stay there. They don't burn out and they protect the car, especially if you have to leave it. Okay, now, we have the car safe. Maybe we want to attempt to perform some basic repairs to try to get it going again. Well, there are some things that each and every car on the road should have. First off, you should always have a tire gauge. This is mandatory. Secondly, you should always have a flashlight in the car, be it a small one like this or a large one. You must have a flashlight. Now, to perform minor repairs, because lots of times the things that will disable the car could be easily and quickly repaired if you had some basic tools. Here is a multi-pointed screwdriver. It has interchangeable tips on it so that it can be a straight-bladed, a Phillips, or a Torx headed screwdriver. This takes care of all of those types of screws. You want one of those. 
You also want a pair of needle nose pliers. This gets you into those tight places. A pair of slip joint pliers. They act like a wrench for a lot of things, and they give you a lot of capabilities as far as turning awkward shaped things. Over here, this is an adjustable wrench. Always want one of those, but you don't want it too big. Big ones typically are going to be too clumsy. A small ball peen hammer is also a good piece of equipment to have. Now, if you really want to be professional about it and cover all of the bases, over here we have a set of open-end box wrenches. Make sure that your car has either metric or normal bolts and nuts on it and buy either metric or standard open-end box wrenches. Now, some of the things that you need as far as parts are concerned. The most typical thing that is going to give you a problem are going to be electrical problems. The most typical electrical problems are going to be blown fuses. You want an assortment of fuses. Now here is the old type of glass fuse. Don't be fooled and buy those just automatically. Find out exactly what type of fuses your car has and get the proper types. The most typical thing that you're going to find in a modern car is right here, this one with the two prongs on it. That's been around for several years now, but now there are two new types of that style of fuse. We have this little mini fuse that we're seeing quite frequently, and over here this big maxi fuse. Both of those are difficult to find. If your car has them, carry spares with you. Now one of the other things that you would want here, plastic electrical tape. Want a roll of that. That helps you patch bare wires and that sort of thing. Here we have plastic wire ties. These are used to tie things up. If something breaks and starts to hang down, you can hold it in place with these tie wraps. Then, a spare fan belt. You know, a fan belt breaks, you're out of business. One of the more typical things that you're going to find that causes problems, broken radiator or heater hoses. Here we have a hose repair kit. Good thing to have. Get you to the nearest repair shop. Couple of basic things, an extra quart of oil, some extra brake fluid. It's a good idea to have a fire extinguisher in your car, always. You might want to have a first aid kit. That is something good to have. Now over here, this is probably luxury. This is a tire pump. Plugs into the cigarette lighter, pumps up the flat tire. Very, very handy in many cases. Now you have all of this stuff, you have to keep it in the car. How do you do that? Here we have a plastic toolbox. Why plastic? Well, because trunks are typically damp. Metal toolboxes tend to rust and make a mess of the toolbox and the trunk of the car. One last thing, you're going to put all these metal tools in this toolbox. They're going to tend to rust even though they're in a plastic box. Here's a little trick. Take some brown wrapping paper, soak it with oil, wrap the metal tools in this wrapping paper before you put them in the toolbox keeps the tools from rusting. Now, if you do all of this, you're going to be prepared for any of those emergencies that you could actually deal with on the highway. And if you have a problem with your car, write to me. If I use your letter on the air, I'll send you a MotorWeek t-shirt. The address is MotorWeek, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. That's MotorWeek, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. Ever since Carroll Shelby created the legendary AC Cobra in the 1960s, car enthusiasts have longed for a sequel. When Chrysler unveiled the retro muscle Dodge Viper at the Detroit Auto Show two years ago, it looked like their prayers might be answered. But at the time, the V10 dream car was just that. The Viper was intended as an expression of Chrysler's corporate vitality, not for actual production. But once the public was bitten by the Viper, things changed fast. Vipers will go on sale early next year. However, the goal of the exercise has not changed. Detroit's North American International Auto Show, January 1989. That's where the world got its first look at the Dodge Viper RT10. A wonderfully simple two-seat roadster designed to show off Chrysler's imagination and its V10 engine that was supposed to do most of its work in trucks Chrysler called the Viper a true American sports car. And while the Viper was the hit of the show, Chrysler's ability to make such a car was the big question. Well, here it is, almost. 
In just a few months, the first production Vipers will pass through selected Dodge dealers and into the hands of its admirers, only three years after its Detroit debut. That's a third less time than it traditionally takes to develop a traditional car. And that's what the Viper story is all about, making cars faster, cheaper, but better. Viper is the pilot for how Chrysler expects to manage its next generation of passenger cars. The Viper legend apparently began with another legend, Carroll Shelby. It is said that he convinced Chrysler President Bob Lutz to make a 90s answer to his 60s Cobra. Fact is that this rather small design room is where the Viper's incubation is taking place. This is the home of Team Viper. Here labors a small collection of volunteer engineers covering all of the specialties of the Chrysler organization, all in one room. In many ways, it is a car company within a car company, practicing a gospel known as simultaneous engineering. Executive engineer for Viper, Roy Soberg, explains. The, the conventional methodology of, of automotive industries and, and actually large organizations, large structures, uh, has been you, you go from A to Z by going A to B to C to D. In simultaneous engineering, it's all happening at the same time concurrently. And, and it doesn't happen overnight. That's a culture change. But uh, for Viper, I, I think we've almost nicknamed it the Big Bang. Uh, because when you do simultaneous engineering, things happen very quickly. Uh, things happen concurrently then you see a number of issues come together at one time. And that is uncomfortable to deal with at first, but it means that everyone makes their designs collaborate, as it were, so that the product is manufacturable at the same time it's being designed. Communication is the simple key to Team Viper's efficiency. When the team leader wants to get everyone's attention, his method is just as simple and effective. VR19, our first program car, will be coming from New Mac this afternoon, so I want each of the engineers to take a look at the vehicle, make sure the parts are correct on it. While most engineering staffs have to drive to the shops where their prototypes are built and tested, for Team Viper, it's a short walk down the hall. Seeing if an idea works or finding a fix if it doesn't can be managed very quickly. Take, for instance, designs for the removable fabric top and side curtains pieces of the Viper puzzle that, while not in the original concept, are concessions to practicality. This is also where the first 400 horsepower all-aluminum V10 Viper engines are installed in test chassis. Here too, most of the development problems of the Viper design were exposed, and likewise the milestones celebrated. And while there were major development problems in bringing the Viper to ground, our first impression is that they all have been addressed. Our time in this prototype Viper at Chrysler's Proving Grounds was measured in minutes. But it was enough to dispel some obvious suspicions about the car. The Viper is not a V10 Cobra. It is a far smoother operator. Engine vibration is well isolated, yet its 8 liters still manage to snap your head back into the seat as you zoom beyond 60 miles per hour in under 4.5 seconds. Handling is near neutral with a tail that can be expertly controlled in small degrees with the sensitive throttle. The clutch and shift linkage for the six-speed Borg Warner gearbox are heavy that seem suited to the car's character. The special Michelin tires grip hard, but not so hard that the Viper is sluggish to maneuver at low speeds. The ride of the Viper is firm, but not bone-jarring as we expected. No, the Viper is not a Cobra replica. It is both more civilized and impressive than that. While the Viper will be a sales success, only time will tell if it's an engineering success. If Chrysler can transfer the way it designed the Viper to more complex models, the exercise will have been worthwhile. Judging by the car and the enthusiasm we encountered with the men and women of Team Viper, we'd take a bite any day. Our car of the week is a 1957 Pinard Dina, a most unorthodox French creation. It belongs to Morris Knudsen of Tulare, California. Now, if you have a special car that you'd like to show off, we'll consider it for car of the week. Just send a good color photograph and a self-addressed return envelope 
to Motor Week, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. Now with the latest motor news, here's Motor Week's Lisa Barrow. Lisa? This week, John, Motor Week gets its first look at an upcoming Volvo model, thanks to our friends at Sweden's Traffic Magazine. This is the Volvo 850 GLT. It's the first of a new generation of Volvo sedans and the first front-drive Volvo to be sold in the U.S. The 850 is substantially different from any previous Volvo sedan, but you may not be able to tell that from the styling. It looks very much like current Volvos. However, it is the most aerodynamic front end yet seen on a four-door Volvo. The rear deck is also smoother, but the big news back here is an all-new rear suspension. The new system is based around Volvo's new two-piece Delta Link rear axle and is claimed to offer the advantages of both a fully independent rear and a live axle. Power is from Volvo's new 20-valve five-cylinder engine. It produces 170 horsepower and is linked to either a compact five-speed gearbox or a four-speed automatic. The interior is quite slick by Volvo standards with a very clean, smooth dash. Interior features include a split folding rear seat, pass-through door for skis, integral child seat, and folding front seat to offer a dizzying array of cargo and passenger carrying possibilities. It's all wrapped in a very compact package. The 850 is actually smaller than current 700 series sedans. Thanks, Lisa. Craig Singhaus travels all over America in search of stories. His behind-the-scenes crew usually consists of a videographer and his co-producer, Maria Purdom. But this time on the high road, Craig takes a back seat while Maria makes her debut in front of the camera and behind the wheel. Guys, if, you, if you think that you can go around turn three and give us a clear shot and stay like out of the... You know, normally out on the high road, I get to have all the fun driving cars while my television partner, Maria Purdom, is behind the camera directing all the action. Well, this week at historic Flemington Speedway in Flemington, New Jersey... It's my turn to race. Go for it, Maria. Maria would be racing micro stocks, sort of a go-kart with a roll cage. Wait a minute, I'll let her tell you about it. I've got a TV spot to produce. A micro stock is similar to a racing go-kart, except that the driver is fully protected by a stout roll cage and a five-point safety harness. Also, all drivers must wear these horribly attractive fireproof suits, so I felt pretty safe. And since, just like a full-size NASCAR modified, microstocks only make left-hand turns, everything is offset to the left. Microstock administrator Al Pantaseca explains what makes these babies go. What we run is five horsepower Briggs & Stratton motors in our microstocks. The Sportsman Division are getting about seven horsepower out of their motors. The Modified Division, we get 22 horsepower and we run methanol. Sportsman cars are capable of speeds over 70 miles an hour, while the Modifieds can do over 100 miles an hour. Hmm. 100 miles per hour, one inch off the ground. Maybe I should leave all this driving stuff up to Craig. Meanwhile, I can't get the in-car camera to work. Hmm. Maybe I should leave all this TV stuff up to Maria. Now, is this thing have to be flipped back and record? Oh, well, he'll figure it out. At this point, I need some basic microstock advice. Right, this is the extent of our onboard computer system. It's our cylinder head and tack gauge. Okay, we can switch it back and forth. What I do is I rest my elbows on the outside pods and it gives you a little bit more leverage. Okay. Leverage, RPM, cylinder head temperature, it sure is a lot to learn. I guess I'll just watch what the other drivers do and learn while I turn. Wonder how Craig is making out. Gosh, the stupid in-car camera. How the heck does Maria make this thing work? The American Microstock Racing Association, or AMSRA, has been sanctioning racing for over a decade, primarily in the mid-Atlantic states. They have an excellent reputation for safety, sportsmanship, and fun. And now they were about to let me join the ranks. Okay, you push yourself down. Okay, you want to feel like you're a part of the seat. You want your okay. back to everything to be set down into it. Okay. okay. Next, it was off to the starting grid. And we're off. There I was dicing with number 64. I was determined to catch him when out of the corner of my eye, I saw the checkered flag. Woo! Yes! All right! That was great! <laughs> oh, that was wonderful. All right. Well, I was hooked. I loved it, and I couldn't wait to drive again. As for Craig, 
He couldn't wait to go back to driving again either. In camera fiber. Join us next week for a very special edition of Motor Week 92 when we take an up close and personal look at the history of Jaguar. You won't want to miss it. I'm John Davis. We'll see you then. Motor Week 92 is made possible by funding from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the financial support of viewers like you. If you'd like a transcript of this program, send $4 to Motor Week Transcripts, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. Residents of Maryland add 20 cent sales tax. Ask for show number 1112. is a production of Maryland Public Television.